Well, I didn't make human nature, but I do know what they read and what they watch. I make my nut of what people really want. Logan Roy is a different type of manipulator than we're used to seeing on TV. In Vince Gilligan's world, the manipulator usually has the odds stacked against them and has to figure out a way to psychologically outmaneuver their opponents. But in Jesse Armstrong's world, it's the opposite. Here the manipulator is the obstacle that needs to be overcome, armed with all the chips in his corner that he can use to bully, coerce, and puppet master everyone around him. He may say he understands people, but really he just understands how to exploit them, how to weaponize their wants and fears so that they do whatever he wishes. You may have encountered a bully like this in your daily life, someone that uses everything at their disposal to steamroll those in front of them, whether it's emotional abuse, financial coercion, or outright manipulation. So let's take a deeper look at how Logan Roy sinisterly manipulates everyone over the course of succession. His favourite tactic is coercion. Unfortunately, fear is a great motivator, which puts the person who has the power to do the most damage in a disproportionately advantageous position. While most of us wouldn't want to inflict harm on another individual unless we absolutely had to, Logan Roy feels nothing about emotionally abusing his employees and family members, allowing them to feel as if their livelihood, relationships and safety constantly hangs in the balance. But in order to do that, he needs to set the stakes for his victim right up front, so that they know the danger they're trying to avoid. For example, when he wants to sniff out any insubordination, he openly confronts Carl about how he cheats on his wife and threatens to get her on speakerphone to tell her. By showing off his weapons like this, and demonstrating that there is no low he will not stoop to, he creates a chill effect in the room, and suddenly an unfair request, like everyone open your phones and put them on the table, is met with immediate compliance. Or if we look at how he manipulates Kendall into retreating from the bear hug, again, Logan subtly sets the stakes for his victim first. He brings his son into the room, informs him the police are already here, and details all the evidence they have against him, that his keycard was found near the incident, and that he was spotted by a security guard. All of this will naturally cause Kendall's emotional torture to begin, replaying this worst case scenario in his mind over and over, and seeing how all the pieces of the puzzle line up. So now that Logan has his victim cornered and petrified, he then offers him a solution, a safe way back to dry land. This has been quite stressful. Why don't you get in my car and we'll drive you to the plane and then you can relax. On one side is a series of terrifying possibilities, and on the other is a comforting escape plan. Now Kendall technically does have a choice here, but the odds are heavily stacked against him to do anything other than what Logan wants. He's still scrambling to not give up, so Logan asks the others to leave the room for a private moment. He then stands over his son to emphasize his towering authority and barks his orders down at him, to tell Sandy and Stewie He's out. So Logan's strategy here is to show you his hand, threaten to use it, and then emotionally batter you into compliance. The same coercive tactics were at play during the vote of no confidence. Kendall should have the numbers to overthrow his father, but because Logan refuses to leave the room, it means they're going to have to risk being seen betraying him, meaning if it fails, they'll be swiftly fired. This added danger turns what was meant to be a vote of no confidence in Logan into a vote of no confidence in Kendall, as now everyone in the room would need to fully believe that Kendall has fully convinced the majority of the board in order to vote in his favour. And when Roman even hesitates in voting against his father, Logan bulldozes him and announces it on the record that Roman is with him. It's tough, but maybe... Roman for me. I'm not sure we can count that for you. Roman! Against. This moment highlights how Logan sniffs out any vulnerability and instantly exploits it, as he knows that if Roman was already struggling to commit to his answer without any added interference, by forcing him onto his team, he's added another psychological hurdle. 
now Roman would need to make an even bigger point of betraying his father to go back to the other side, which scares him into changing team as that's now the path of least resistance. So Logan bullies and manipulates by essentially blackmailing his victims into compliance. This scene also highlights one of Logan's favourite weapons in mental warfare, social pressure. It's so much easier to backstab someone behind closed doors, but having to look your victim in the eye as you undermine, harm or destroy them is something most people don't have the stomach for. So when Logan wants to pressure Roman into signing the papers to put Marsha on the trust, he asks him what he thinks about it in front of Marsha, using her as an emotional pawn to influence Roman into conceding. When Kendall wants to steal the family business, Logan arranges for the siblings to confront him as a collective, to socially isolate Kendall and try to wear him down, knowing that the fear of being outcast from his family will inflict psychological damage. So, how's the torture going? Back in hunter-gatherer times, if we were banished from our tribe, we would die out in the wilderness alone. This is why one of our deepest fears is social ostracization. Without our tribe, without social connection and emotional nourishment, we feel in more danger and psychologically wither away. So Logan creates a stark contrast between how it feels to be in his community and how lonely it feels to be outside of it. Given he runs a media empire, Logan has the power to control the public narrative, so that once you're out, he can literally influence the rest of the world to turn on you at the same time, to compound your insecurities. We see him hang this exact threat over Shiv's head when she starts working for Gil. I've always tried to do right by you, Siobhan. And maybe, maybe I should just let them come for you. And by saying, maybe I should just let them come for you, Logan is painting a new picture that's in sharp contrast to the truth. Although he is blatantly threatening to damage her reputation, he's somehow flipping it around to sound like he's actually been the only one protecting her from a community of snakes that are all ravenous to take her down. This ups the stakes and makes disobeying his orders feel like actively putting yourself in harm's way. Logan has a ruthless way of identifying someone's darkest fears and then confirming it back to them. For instance, one of Kendall's biggest weaknesses is that he cares what people think. He wants others to validate that he really is someone that can change the world for the better. So in order to control him, Logan constantly belittles him and reminds him how easily he can take that all away. And whenever they're at odds, suddenly all these stories of Kendall allegedly acting crazy or being back on drugs will start appearing in the papers designed to damage his credibility amongst his colleagues, friends, and even his own kids. Then when the two face off over dinner in season 3, Logan starts probing him about what really happened with the waiter, this time speculatively throwing out all the different headlines he could print to shame Kendall into breaking. Or when he originally needed to coerce Kendall about the waiter, his final threat is one of reputational destruction. This could be the defining moment of your life. It'd eat everything. A rich kid kills a boy, you'd never be anything else. This makes it seem as if sticking with Logan is the only means of survival. Without him, everything you know will be gone and your reputation will be destroyed. The next tactic he employs is making everyone beneath him competing rivals. If everyone could come together and form alliances, then he'd be more likely to be toppled, as people are stronger in groups than they are on their own. But instead, whether they're siblings or colleagues, they're all in constant competition with each other as a means of rising the ranks. Someone else's failure could mean your opportunity for success, so Logan has created an incentive structure in which you have no reason to look out for anyone's interests but your own. You can betray, backstab, or play both sides, but as long as you're working in his favour, then he'll bring you closer to his inner circle. But despite making people openly fight it out in front of him, Logan rarely ever factors in anyone else's point of view. He trusts his own gut over everything else. So why even have people offer ideas in the first place? Partially it's to pit them against each other, divide and conquer. But Logan also likes to use people as scapegoats for his own decisions. 
This means that an open floor for ideas often turns into a game of guess what Logan wants you to say, rather than characters truly speaking their mind. For example, with Walter, Logan could just take a look at the company's financials and make a decision himself, but instead he sends both Roman and Kendall to get a feel for the place, knowing that Kendall has a favourable bias as buying that company is literally his only crowning achievement in this industry. But by sending Roman with him, he's now created an incentive for Roman to represent the opposing side, as he gains nothing by just agreeing with his brother. Whereas if he dismisses Walter and says it should be gutted, then he may have guessed the right answer and win the exchange. So the two brothers compete and Roman optically wins, leaving Kendall with the punishment of shutting down his only achievement. Now if Logan just asked him to do this directly, without the phony investigation, it would seem vindictive, but instead he's rigged the situation where now Roman gets the credit for essentially doing what he always wanted to do anyway. This way Logan can pretend that his mind was swayed by a better argument, but really he knew that by sending these two rivals to a department together, they're both going to return with differing opinions, and therefore he can essentially make Roman do his bidding for him. It's all a game of turning people into puppets for your own ideas so that you don't need to take responsibility for it. We see this play out again in Season 4, when Logan asks Tom and Sid for their honest opinion about Kerry's audition tape. Tom has no idea what his boss wants to hear, so he tries to wriggle out of it and pick up more clues before he answers. Well, did you... What, what do you think, Logan? Oh, no, 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 no. But Logan won't play ball. But given he is dating Carrie, Tom and Sid both err on the side of caution and say they think she's really got something, as they don't want to be the ones to create a rift in that relationship. If that's what Logan likes to hear, then we agree. But then later in that same episode, as Logan starts to realise people secretly think Carrie is bad at the job, he now needs someone else to take the blame for shutting her down. He returns to Tom who's still echoing the old narrative that Carrie has really got something. So now Logan needs to subtly guide Tom into saying the new narrative that he wants him to say. Therefore, he opens the door for criticism by asking, is she the finished article? And now Tom starts hedging both sides, until Logan rewards him for saying the right words. Uh -huh. Maybe, maybe quite a bit of time. Interesting. Yeah, she's, uh, she's raw. This positive feedback incentivizes Tom to speak freely, and he comes up with new narratives to let Carrie down. He does such a good job of expressing the right way of breaking the news that Logan rewards him with the responsibility of saying it to Carrie himself, reminding Tom that he's not involved and knows nothing. So in both scenes, using the same puppet, Logan manufactures two completely different answers both of which are what he wanted to hear at the time. So you have to wonder, are Logan's employees ever really speaking their mind, or are they just parroting the party line? And this leads into arguably his most abusive strategy, creating a false reality. This is real. This is real. Logan Roy manipulates all of his children with false promises typically acting as if he's now grooming them to be his successor so he can get his hooks in them. Kendall guts Walter, Roman fires Jerry, Shiv quits working in politics. But does it count for anything in the end? Does he ever actually make good on his promises? Or does the time for him to finally step down keep moving forward? And when asked if he ever actually believed they could do the top job, does he look like he's never even really fully considered it a possibility? Like any narcissist or cult leader, Logan makes his followers adapt to his narrative rather than reality, and if they fail to live up to his desires, they risk banishment. This makes the truth irrelevant, as the truth is whatever Logan wants it to be, and when coupled with coercion and social ostracization, it's no surprise that everyone is on edge. They can't tell what's fact or fiction, what's a joke or what's serious. He can tell employees to pee in a bucket instead of leaving the room, or ask presidential candidates to bring him a coke and fire the deputy attorney general just to test their compliance. 
And then the moment they give in and lower themselves to whatever he requested, he says it's a joke. I wasn't bullying or abusing you, it just felt like I was, but it was only a funny joke. This way they show their hand and express their loyalty, but he never has to take accountability for twisting their arm. Even when he asks his team if anyone thinks he should be punished for the cruise scandal, they have no idea whether he's being genuine or tricking them with another loyalty test. No, no. No, never. Never. No, 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 no. Not in the middle of a proxy fight. I don't think so. So they all start singing from the same hymn sheet, crazily convincing Logan to punish one of them instead of taking responsibility himself. So now, even though the board actually wanted Logan to go down for it, he's puppet mastered his own team not to let him. As by never letting them know what's real or imaginary, they always have to err on the side of caution. A classic example of creating a false reality is what happens after he hits Roman in Argestes. Here Logan knows he's in the wrong and knows there were witnesses. So let's look at the words he uses to gaslight his own son into thinking it basically never even really happened. I was gonna say that thing up in Argestes. Already he's not calling it what it is, he's cloaking his assault under vague terms. That thing up in Argestes makes it sound like it's hard for anyone to pinpoint what really happened. After all, memories are so unreliable. I didn't even know you were there, I mean if I did I wouldn't have, you know. Still not apologizing. The thing that happened, whatever it was, was only an accident. And then he turns the tables onto Roman. Did I even make contact? So here he's hiding behind ignorance while simultaneously undermining any pain he might have felt, as if Roman would have to be a baby for being upset over an assault so insignificant. Now of course Roman could correct the record here, but as we've covered, standing up to Logan doesn't come without its risks. If Logan wants to minimise it and you want to keep competing for the top job, you need to minimise it too. Then he closes with, because that's not something I do. So just full on gaslighting here. That's not something I do is the narrative Logan wants Roman to live in. But we literally saw this is something he did do, there was contact, there was blood, but if he says it's not something he does, then I guess it never happened. This is gross emotional manipulation to downplay his mistakes and cause Roman to doubt his own victimization, rather than simply taking responsibility and apologizing for his actions. Logan Roy is one of the most intimidating characters in television history, but what makes him so compelling is not how he uses his power, but how he abuses it. How he's not just willing to lie to the public, but everyone around him, trying to bend reality in his favour and will his own desires into existence. In the most cynical and primitive way, he does understand how people work, or at least what they want and what they fear. Which is why he manipulates his victims by presenting almost everything as a starkly contrasted binary choice. Do you want to lose your job or keep your job? Do you want to be on the plane or in police custody? Do you want your reputation intact or in tatters? Are you in or out? Are you with me or against me? And under this kind of pressure, with your physical, financial and emotional well-being on the line, it's no surprise that most people end up taking the path of least resistance, and simply parroting whatever Logan wants to hear, voluntarily making themselves a disposable pawn in his game in the hopes that one day, one of his promises is finally fulfilled. Well, if you've made it this far, firstly, thank you for watching, but if you could now give the video a like, possibly even leave a comment and click on that subscribe button, it will encourage that mysterious algorithm to do its thing. 